Episode 281, May the 18th, 2017. On this week's show, we'll find out more details about the Jeep Wrangler pickup, and we'll hear about cannonballs in the drivetrain of the new Compass. We'll play your voicemails and answer your tech questions. Well, Tammy's on a little break. Again. But calls into the show live from Moab. That's right. We'll talk to her from the world-famous wheeling destination. We'll also cover the infamous Jeep headlight flicker and what the can system is on our Jeeps. All that and a little Amazon you bought what thrown in there, too. All on this episode of the Jeep Talk Show. You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. Podcasting since 2010. Are you ready? It's the Jeep Talk Show. With Tammy on Wrangler. Tony and Josh on Cherokee. So sit back. Strap in. And brace yourself. Local Jeep News, National Jeep News, and news from around the world. It's This Week in Jeep. From cannonballs to drivelines. Yeah, you heard right. The redesigned 2017 Compass is the key to Jeep's strategy to grow its global sales to more than 2 million units a year. And the key to the Compass, as well as the smaller Jeep Renegade, is an innovative fuel-saving disconnecting driveline system developed by GKN. GKN Driveline, a British company that traces its roots to making cannonballs during the Napoleonic Wars, provides PTO, power takeoff, axles, drive shafts, and differentials for all compasses and renegades globally. Hmm, renegade with a PTO. Y'all want to watch me till the back 40 with my cute ute and this tractor implement? Shouldn't be pretty good here. Hold my beer. Anyway, uh, more importantly, considering the Jeep's 2014 through 2016 history of transmission driveline problems, GKN provides the much-needed software that keeps the driveline system running smoothly. Remember all those recalls early on in the new Cherokee's debut? Yeah, FCA tried doing it on their own, and it took years to get it mostly right. Transmission and driveline problems delayed the launch of the 2014 Cherokee for months, and even then was plagued for months after with issues and recalls. This is a very unique four-wheel drive, use, four-wheel drive system. It's not often that a supplier launches technology toe-to-toe with the direct competitors, but that's exactly what happened earlier this decade. The first application of GKN's disconnecting all-wheel drive system was with the launch of the Range Rover Evoque in mid-2011. GKN's system, which is supplied to Fiat Chrysler, General Motors, Ford, and Jaguar Land Rover, uses a series of clutches in the front and rear differentials to control when and where the power is sent. That allows up to three wheels to spin freely under minimum load, while the two-piece drive shaft stays stationary, reducing parasitic energy losses when added traction is not needed. When added traction or power is needed, as determined by sensor inputs, the clutches engage and send power to the additional wheels. This process of mechanically engaging or disengaging takes place in barely three-tenths of a second. Uh, Try engaging your ox locker that fast, huh? Now, the rapid transition allows engineers more latitude in vehicle development. An automaker can create a crossover or SUV with added fuel efficiency that is still capable of conquering rugged off-road terrain. Tellingly, after the Cherokee's troubled launch, Jeep switched to GKN's disconnecting driveline system on its next two front-wheel drive-based vehicles, the Renegade and the redesigned Compass. Part of the reason had to do with GKN's global launch. Jeep's new compact and subcompact segment SUVs are now being built in Italy, Mexico, Brazil, India, and even China. Jeep needed a supplier solution that would allow the brand to approach markets around the world. GKN fit the bill. Well, Jeep pickup update. How about some new spy photos? Yeah, that's right. You heard me. Last year, we got our first good look at the long-awaited Jeep Wrangler pickup long before its projected debut in now late 2019. Now a heavily camouflaged Wrangler pickup is out on public roads doing some testing, providing us with our best look yet at this highly anticipated truck. Up front, we can see Jeep's famous 7-slat grill, as we expect. And we can barely make out the horizontal LED daytime running lamps with the 2018 Wrangler is widely believed to receive. The bed on this truck also looks a lot more production-ready than the one we've seen on the Wrangler pickup prototype that was spied last year. Around back, we see rectangular taillights that are very similar to today's JK Generation Wrangler, though covered in heavy camouflage. This particular truck is a four-door unlimited model, though I wouldn't be surprised to see the Wrangler pickup offered with a two-door body style just like the regular model. 
The wheels on this prototype look the same as those offered on today's Wrangler Rubicon, but they could change before the truck reaches production and likely will. The only other noteworthy thing is the single tailpipe that ex exits on the driver's side. On last year's Spide prototype, the exhaust exited on the passenger side. You'll probably also notice the blue wiring coming out from the rear driver's side and the pick that we're showing uh, right underneath that door, and it runs clear onto the underside of the body, indicating that this is very much a prototype undergoing some tests. Now, we should see the Wrangler pickup before the end of 2019, and hopefully before then, and actually get our hands on one. Well, for this and all the latest Jeep news, Jeepers, be sure to subscribe. And if you have something you, should be, you think we should be reporting on or you have a response to any one of our stories, be sure to let us know by sending an email to info at jeeptalkshow.com. Jeep truck. Boy, did you ever think that was going to happen? I mean, they had the, uh, the Comanche way back when, and that was a pretty cool-looking little vehicle. And uh, now... Well, uh, and they uh, had the FSJs back in the day, too. The yeah. uh, J10, J20, the, uh, the full-size Jeeps that uh, were, you know, kind of on the old uh, Wagoneer-style frames, the old Cherokee frames. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but, yeah, you know, the Jeep pickups, this will be the third iteration, essentially, of Jeep pickups, if, uh, you know, if you want to get technical. But... Uh, I can't wait to see what the number's going to be like, your performance numbers, going to see what, you know, this thing does on the trail, uh, towing, cargo, you know, all that sort of stuff. I want to get gearhead numbers on this thing, and I want to get you guys that news, too. Yeah. So, uh, of course, you were, you were mentioning the earlier trucks. Uh, that One of them was uh, made uh, very popular in the, uh, the movie, gosh, some 20 years ago, the, uh, the movie Twister. Where they trashed that uh, oh, that, yeah, that, that's right. uh, that pickup. What, what, uh, what two-letter designator was that? No, oh, you would have to bring that up. I, I, I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. I thought now. you just said it. Oh, the J, well, there was J10 and J20, but yes, I don't think it. that those were no, I think it was. official. Uh, oh, gee, yeah, now you got me. I don't know. I, but I know that that was the model, but I don't know if that was the official two-letter designation. Oh, yeah, so, you're probably yeah. right. I'm, I'm uh, confusing the two things together. So that's probably what it was. But yeah, that was because I actually did a, uh, had a Craigslist search going for a while. That was a uh, a Honcho Hondo, Hondo. I think it was a Hondo model. Oh, yeah. Bright yellow with the, uh, the the stickers. I remember remember them back in the seventies. Uh, they were a pretty cool looking pickup. Anyway, I'm going down memory lane here. I just thought it was a real neat pickup, and I just hate seeing them trash that for the movie. Uh, yeah, and then I going know. for that new one. I would rather see that new one trashed, and then <laughs> them keep going with the Jeep. <laughs> uh, that probably was part of the vehicle deal, though. We'll we'll give you this vehicle for the or these vehicles. For the movie, but uh, right, right. Oh, I, well, hey, that, speaking of uh, of uh, places where vehicles get trashed, um, we have uh, one of our co-hosts actually in a place that all of you guys out there might recognize. It's a little place called Moab. That's the name of that bomb that they dropped, hey. right? Yeah, mother of all bombs. <laughs> but <laughs> well, speaking of mothers, uh, we got the one and only Jeep Mama on the line. Hey guys, how are you? Doing well, Tammy. Tell us where where are you exactly, and and how far away are you from some trails? I am probably less than a mile from the trails. I'm in downtown Moab, and you guys, I have not wiped this grin off my face since about eleven o'clock this morning. I flew into Salt Lake City, and I took the back road back roads into Moab on Utah 128, which is the most amazing drive into Moab ever. I, it was so amazing. Um, it was spectacular. The views are just, I cannot even describe it. It's been like the best experience ever. And I'm not even on dirt roads yet. Um, so are you going to get a chance to, uh, so to get some trail time tomorrow or at least over the weekend? Um, tomorrow night, I will be taking a deep sunset tour, and then Saturday, I'll be all day out on Hell's Revenge, um, and hopefully some other trails. Well, if you guys are out in Moab, Utah, you want to try and find Tammy, I highly encourage it. She'll be out there, got some cards, maybe even a sticker or two for you guys, and of course, always willing to talk some Jeep. Tammy, I, I hope you have just an amazing time. Uh, keep the rubber side down, would you? And let us know how it goes. Oh, of I will. And um, just to let you know, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be meeting um, the lady from Ladies Off-Road Network, Charlene, and we're going to have breakfast together, and hopefully we'll get her on the Jeep Talk Show one of these days. Well, looking forward to it. Tammy, if people want to get uh, connect with you out there, how can they find you on social media? 
Um, I suggest the best way is to uh, message me on Facebook. I'm um, Jeep Mama or Tammy Thompson Forsyth. Um, you can find me. Um, or even on Instagram, you can instant message me on Instagram. Cool beans. If you guys are out here, I'd love to hook up with you. Yeah, and uh, if, uh, if, if you have a, an extra $5 with you, she'll take a picture with you. Oh, come on. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, that's Jeep Mama. She's got like I'll eight take, billion Google I'll, Plus. I'll take a picture for. <laughs> I'll take a picture for free. Oh, uh, okay. So very good. You know, she's just saying that because the house always gets twenty uh, percent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not. <laughs> All right, Tammy. I'll have a good time out there and be safe. I will. Thank you, guys. Have a good show. All right. Bye, bye. Slacker. She's off, goofing off again, Josh. Vacationing <laughs> out in Moab. God. We don't take vacations on a Thursday. We have a show to do. Well, no, <laughs> she's, she's, uh, she's doing good. She, I'm sure she's getting a lot of pictures. Uh, she's in a place that all of us, I'm sure, <laughs> wishing we could be right now. I know I am for sure. So uh, I'm, I'm jealous. Living vicariously through the Jeep Mama. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Happy to have her out there, too. Well, hey, Jeepers, have you ever wanted to interact with the show as it's being recorded? Well, now you can tweet to the live show. Just send us a tweet by adding hashtag Jeep Talk Show during the live show and watch for your tweet at the bottom of the YouTube video. Remember, that's hashtag Jeep Talk Show and your tweets show up on the live video as we broadcast the show. Damn, that sounded good, Josh. That was like really professional. <laughs> it was like the sitting back watching the show. <laughs> hey, is the Jeep Talk Show just not enough for you? Need more? Well, we have more for you. Yeah, we do. <laughs> this past Tuesday, Tammy and I interviewed Garrett with Best Top. Yeah, Best Top. You know, the people that put the tops on Jeeps. So, uh, well, anyway, let's have a little snippet here of uh, what we did with, uh, with Garrett. It's the Jeep Talk Show call-in show with Tammy and Tony. We've uh, been proudly partnering with uh, Jeep since 1986. Uh, we've been the exclusive soft top provider uh, of Jeep since that time. And uh, I was so grateful for that partnership and, and very proud to provide soft tops. We've been having a lot of fun experimenting with uh, different color options of many of our soft tops at Best Top. And uh, what, what I have on my Jeep right now is a, an experimental red version of that Sunrider for hard top. And uh, it, it came about because we've been testing with a lot of colors on our soft tops. And in fact, uh, we are just uh, weeks away from offering uh, up to six colors on many of our very popular soft tops. And, Ooh, yeah. my Jeeps are sexy. <laughs> See? That's, yeah, so, and so, there's no fair. Are you me to break yeah. the tie here? Yes. <laughs> Mine is oh. black. Oh. Yay! <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> that was the wrong answer. No, no. Garrett just knows what cool is. <laughs> so uh, the Jeep Talk call-in show, just go to YouTube.com slash Jeep Talk Show on, t uh, on Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central Time. And Tammy and I will have a guest interview. Then we'll turn it over to you, the listeners. All you need is a phone and a voice. The Jeep Talk call-in show every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Central Time on YouTube.com slash Jeep Talk Show. And coming up on episode 39 of the call-in show, Gene with All Things Jeep. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. Uh, Tammy will be back in time. All right, so let's get over to our uh, next in the series uh, with Nate of Wrangler Extreme, the YJ series, or as he's calling it, YJ Love. Thank goodness oh. the Jeep didn't go with KY as the model's two-letter designator. Uh, this week, YJ... Hey <laughs> where's that? Where's that rim shot? <laughs> this week, YJ Interior. Hey Jeepers, this is Nate with SWBCrawler.com with another edition of Wrangler Extreme. I'm continuing my YJ Love series, as I'm calling it. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about uh, some interior options that you might have seen on the YJ and also some trim levels. So first of all, the YJ's interior was updated from the earlier CJ models. Uh, the CJ's had a very, very minimalistic um, dash with uh, pretty much uh, a multifunction gauge cluster and not much else, just a steel plate with a column coming out of the center for a, a steering wheel. Um, the YJ was slightly better with some nice plastic cladding over top of that same metal plate, but uh, the gauges were all separated and uh, you know it was a very 90s utilitarian look or late 80s utilitarian look. Nothing, nothing fancy. I mean, even for the era, there was nothing fancy <laughs> about the YJ's interior. 
the uh, the interior as far as seats and whatnot were concerned. Uh, the seats were almost always vinyl, unless you had purchased uh, a higher trim model. Um, and by that, I mean something like the Sahara or the Rio Grande. Otherwise, you know, like I said, the seats were pretty much always uh, just vinyl seats. Trim packages, like I just mentioned, were pretty much just that. There wasn't such a thing as a Rubicon YJ, uh, and honestly, there weren't all that many drivetrain upgrades you could get aside from the you know 2.5 versus for, versus six cylinder uh, models that I mentioned in the drivetrain um, episode. But basically, you know things like the Sahara, the Rio Grande, the Islander, which is the one that uh, that I had, which was actually kind of a cool one. Um, all of them were really just a set of stickers. Um, certain paint colors, and maybe some interior styling or exterior styling. Otherwise, you know, wheel options, stuff like that. Nothing really substantial. Uh, the only model that really stands out is the Renegade, which had all of this um, external plastic or, or whatever <laughs> cladding, which made it look totally different. And, I mean, some people love them, some people hate them. Look them up online and you'll understand why. Uh, there was, you know, of course, just like any... Um, Current Wrangler, there was a hard top and a soft top model. Um, hard door, you know, full door or half door models. Um, the one big difference between the YJ and the later TJ and JK models is that the hard doors only worked with the hard top. And the soft doors, or I should say the half doors with the soft uppers, only worked with the soft top. Uh, and I know what you're thinking. I've seen soft top YJs with full doors. I know you're wrong, Nate. Well, <laughs> as far as I can tell, from all the research I've done and from every YJ I've ever encountered, that wasn't a factory top. That was probably something like a best top super top or some other modified top that worked with the rounded upper corner on the hard doors. So uh, as far as I could tell, no, you could not get a factory YJ with full doors and a soft top. Uh, the YJ roll cage originally started out looking a lot like the CJs, um, with that center hoop and then the slanted rear back, you know, rear, uh, bars. The, um, uh, the biggest difference was the windshield spreaders. It would go from the main hoop to the windshield to sort of prevent the windshield from collapsing in on you in a, in an accident. Um, in 92, they changed those rear bars to the, the outer loop like we see now in the newer Wranglers, and that was to accommodate the, the uh, shoulder harnesses for the, the seat belts. Uh, believe it or not, in some models of the YJ, the base models, the rear seat was even optional. You could get literally a two-seat YJ with a, you know, no rear seat. Uh, even re things like reclining seats, delay wipers, and tilt steering were all options on the YJ. So no creature comforts for you. All right, so there you go. There's some info about the YJ's interior, or lack thereof. If you want to chat more about this, look me up on the Jeep Talk forums. Thanks. You know, it's really interesting about the soft, uh, the half doors and the soft top and the hard uh, doors and the hard top. It, it kind of makes sense, you know, when you put like yeah. things together. But it's just so it's so strange in today's Jeep world where you could do pretty much any damn thing you want to. Yeah, right. And uh, that's uh, that's interesting stuff. It's nice to hear about the history of Jeeps. It, you know, I, I really didn't get into the Jeeps until I got my first one. I, I, I mean, I, I knew somebody that had a Scrambler. I'd seen one of those. Uh, I'd seen CJs around. I don't think I'd ever uh, ridden in one or even touched one as far as that goes. But, you know, I, I was familiar with Jeeps. But as far as knowing the details of them, I really didn't have a clue, so uh, not until I got my Jeep. So it's interesting hearing about these things that have happened long before uh, my knowledge base started. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and appreciate the knowledge. I'm sure, everybody does. Yes, absolutely. Well, I don't know if everybody finds history interesting, but uh, this type of history I do find interesting. You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. And the Jeep Talk Show is just one of the proud members of the 4x4 Radio Network. Just visit 4x4radionetwork.com and learn more about the 4x4 podcast, the Center Steer podcast, and the Trail Chasers podcast. Hey, did you know it's easy to give us a review on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, or even YouTube? Uh, did we miss your review? Email us at info at jeeptalkshow.com if we did. This week, we have a review uh, for on our new app, Josh, the uh, the Android app that we uh, recently uh, published about, oh, a month and a half ago or so. Uh, yeah. Th yeah, this came in today from, uh, oh, what is, you're going to have to help me with that, TJ Roxycon. Is that, does Very that sound good. like to you? And uh, he simply says, or he or she say, simply says, excellent show. 
Uh, now he went on. Like he actually sent us an email. I don't know if you if that was sent to all of us or not, Josh. But he yeah, sent I us got an email. that. Uh, it was at, at the risk of getting a little political and stuff. Actually, uh, he kind of said something that I that I had touched on in a this week in Jeep segment um, a couple episodes back, talking about the future of Jeep and and whether or yes. not the actual Jeep brand is going to get sold or not. And and he I brought up the question of you know should Jeep just go off on its own. You know, that is one of the options, if, if you will. And and he brought up a good point, I th- thinking that Jeep and Ram should just team up together and become an entity unto their own. And and I, th- I, I would agree with that. I think Jeep and Ram together, uh, leaving Chry- Chrysler, you know, the whole FCA thing by itself, leave that out there to, you know, do what it's going to do. And then Jeep and Ram, <laughs> well, you know, which are definitely, you know, different from the rest, can, uh, can go off and be on their own and, and do what they're going to do. Well, I don't know how you think about it, but it almost sounds like uh, you remove those two things from uh, everything else and it collapses, uh, which I know we don't care because it, the Jeep uh, plods on. But, uh, oh, yeah. I, I, you know, I guess if, it was, if that was possible for them to do, they may have already done it. There, there may not be enough revenue in just Jeep and Ram to be able to accomplish that. But then again, things might be a lot better if it was that ca- just those two brands and, and they would see – there would be more confidence in the company, I think, maybe w- w- for consumers. Yeah, I could, I could agree with you that. But Rams also only uh, has been on their own, more or less, um, as a separate truck. Because it used to be part of Dodge. You know, Ram was just a model, and oh, now it's you know there is no more Dodge truck. It's it's Ram. I thought they know? were part and, of somebody else. I, I thought I didn't know it was just Ram by themselves. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, it's still technically you know Mopar. Right. Uh, so it, it, it's I guess still technically FCA. Um, but it's no longer Dodge. It's not FCA. It's it's Ram. It's a Ram pickup. It's you know, oh, that's, that's what you okay. get. So, um, but I, I could see Jeep doing the same thing. You know, it's not FCA, even though it's still Mopar or you know however you want to say it. Um, it. It's you know they can be by themselves and still together. Hmm. Interesting. Well, it, it would be pretty cool. I remember the old days when GM had like uh, thirty-seven different uh, companies. Yeah. No, right. <laughs> Pontiac and uh, GMC and Chevrolet and. Uh, all that stuff. I was like, wait a minute. Did my Chevy truck looks just like that GMZ. What's the difference? And the people- Well, I mean, you still got the General Motor groups. You know, you got the the, the Cadillac and, yeah, and yeah, you know, all, all that and the GMC and, and G, you know, Chevy and you know, all this. It's still, you still got all, all that more or less. But yeah, you're right. It's been whittled down over the years. Yeah, I guess it had to be. Oh, yeah. The golden years of uh, selling cars back. I guess that was good, uh, good selling them when they would only get about 60,000 miles and you had to get a new one. <laughs> Better than the K cars. <laughs> oh, God. You got tech questions? Ah, oh, what do I ever? We have answers. Oh, that's good. I can, I, it's Tech Talk with Jeep Talk. Yahoo! Well, all the new Jeeps. It's the Pulse with Modulation episode explained. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to keep this good, you know, for you guys as, as you know, even keeled as I can. So here, here we go. For decades, automotive technology has advanced in many ways, from crank start engines to carburetors to fuel injection beyond. To manage this ever-expanding and always evolving growth of automotive technology and, yes, even regulation, computers started making appearances in an also ever-changing and increasing manner. From displays that tell us if a taillight is out or if a door is ajar, even if it is still just a door, or that maybe our washer fluid is low, (laughs) all these different sensors and systems needed management. Enter onto the scene, OBD, or Onboard Diagnostics, a real-time way to sort of monitor, adjust, and report on the status of various systems in the vehicle. Shortly after that came the data bus system, OBD2, a good sequel as far as those sort of things go. OBD2 technology gave us the ability to better monitor emissions and troubleshoot problems, but just like the cassette tape, now this technology was soon to become obsolete too. Now, in today's modern vehicles, including many of our Jeeps, we have CAN, or Controller Area Network, which is a vehicle data bus standard designed to allow different sensors, microcontrollers, and devices to communicate with each other in applications without a host computer. Remember those big old chunky ECUs that cost a fortune to repair and diagnose? Well, no more. So what is the big deal with CAN, and how does it apply to our Jeeps? Well, unlike the OBD2 system, which reads various data streams and voltage from various sensors, which all feed back to the main computer or that ECU, The CAN system is more like a binary stream of data. It's all basically just ones and zeros, ons and offs, in its simplest form. There's a pattern and a science to it, which would take an oscilloscope and more time than we have to fully explain, but I'll try and give you guys a quick, you know, 30,000-foot flyover to get you the basics. Gone are the days of massive wire looms for bunches of wires all going to one system. 
Now with CAN, even more complex systems like engine management, transmission control units, ABS, or traction control systems are all, all now have two parts to each other, a controller and a transceiver, or a unit that both sends and receives signals. Each of these systems are now handled by just two wires. That's right. Think of something as complex as a transmission control unit. Now sending and receiving data through its transceiver and making the necessary adjustments to the transmission as you drive via the controller. All of this done by just two wires. In technical terms, those two wires have names, CAN H or CAN high and CAN L, CAN low, which connect to the, all the devices in the network. The signals on the two CAN lines have the same sequence of data, but their amplitudes are opposite. And I know, a little confusing. So, when the CAN bus is in idle mode, both of these lines carry just 2.5 volts, but when the data bits are being transmitted, the CAN H line increases from 2.5 volts to 3.75 volts, and the corresponding data on the CAN L line, or the opposite line, drops from 2.5 to 1.25, basically the opposite of the other line. Or if you wish, one wire goes 1, the other wire goes 0, creating our binary language. By sending the data in equal and opposite ways like this, it allows for greater noise immunity and therefore less chance of the data being corrupted and, you know, one of those check engine lights popping up on your dash for no good reason whatsoever. Now we can get into the specifics of CAN frames or data messages, how the nodes work, arbitration ID, CRCs, and a bunch of other stuff that's obviously just going to confuse and bore the living you-know-what out of you guys. Our Jeeps, however, run this all through the TIPM, or Totally Integrated Power Module. For the lights in particular, which I know a lot of you guys, is, this is a hot topic, which, let's face it, this is the main reason this discussion has been coming up lately. The TIPM uses a pulse width modulation signal. Yeah, that's the big you know, million dollar term right there, pulse width modulation. If you look at this signal with an oscilloscope, something that can read electrical waves and whatnot, you will see a square wave on for a little bit, then off, on for a little bit, then off, et cetera, et cetera. The end result is that the lights get approximately 8 volts of power sent to them in pulses rather than a constant 12 volts. This increases the bulb life and allegedly reduces fuel consumption, but I seriously just don't see how. The alternator isn't bogged down like an AC pump when it's spinning and could care less about what you have hooked up to it so long as it's not maxed out. And it's not like the spark plugs are hunting, or hurting for voltage. So even if the fuel economy claims are true, you're looking at less than 1% fuel savings here. For incandescent bulbs, this is a great trick as the bulb won't start to dim before the next pulse of power is received. For LEDs or other lights, it doesn't work the same, so that's why you guys get a flicker. Now, there are things like pulse width modulation adapters, sometimes referred to as anti-flicker modules, which basically cancel this out, this pulse, but they, they work by storing the energy and discharging it at a regular rate instead of a pulsed one. You can find them just about anywhere Jeeps are sold, like four-wheel parts or Quadratech or you can find them on Amazon even and help support the show by going to jeeptalkshow.com slash Amazon. This helps you out, Jeepers, gives you a better understanding of why, you know, some Jeep's headlights look like they're strobing at you and, well, why you might be looking at some flicker of your own headlights and, well, better understand how your Jeep works and how it, uh, all the systems work together. Let me, guys, let me know if you guys have a tech question you would like answered here on the Jeep Talk Show. Just go to jeeptalkforum.com, even on your smartphone, or shoot me an email to info at jeeptalkshow.com with a subject line, Tech Talk. Well, I don't know if it's just the uh, my uh, my techie spider senses uh, that are tingling, or perhaps I've just got a uh, a flare up. But uh, I like that, Josh. That was a lot of good uh, technical information, and it sounds like what they're doing is uh, basic TCP/IP net. Well, I shouldn't say basic; it's it's doing it the different way. But like TCP/IP networking, where they're sending these data packets down a very simple amount of uh, a minimal amount of wires. You know, I'm looking forward to the them doing it like they did for the uh, the starships, where they pull it on this all this optical uh, fiber. Everything's oh, on yeah. fiber. Could you imagine the <laughs> bandwidth they'd have on fiber? <laughs> Good lord! Well, hey, this this technology isn't really super duper new. It's actually been around for quite some time in a slightly di different form. Uh, if any of you out there are uh, you know mobile electronics you know uh, gurus at all, you'll understand the term multiplexing, mm -hmm. which is essentially sending a different frequency of electricity down the same wire. And so you could use different resistors to filter out different signals all on the same wire. Believe me, it was a lot of fun hooking up alarm systems and trying to get the door locks to pulse on the same wire that the headlights work on. So, yeah, oh, lots, of, lots of fun. But, uh, but the same, same sort of thing. And uh, Tony, you really hit the nail on the head with, that, with the term packets there because all the data is sort of sent and received in these little packets. 
And it, there, if you look up, you know, canned data streams or whatnot, you know, on a Google search, there's a, you know, some pretty good visual representations of what these data packets look like and how they're comprised and, and what they mean and everything. You know, now I saw a post the uh, the other day on Facebook, and they were uh, actually it was a it was a video that Clyde uh, of the uh, the Paps Boys uh, did, where he was talking about uh, many of the vehicles that they work on these days. You have to have not only the right reader, but a specific reader in some cases, because and I, I, he didn't say it, but I bet you it's because of this, just to diagnose yeah. things, because you can't just put a uh, continuity tester on it. Because you're not going to see, I mean, the, it's the data. You're, you're actually trying to read data. So about the only way you could do it was with an oscilloscope and a handbook trying to figure out what this waveform, you know, what this, uh, this series of pulses uh, means. So, yeah, I can see a, a, a very nice uh, five ten thousand dollars $10,000 reader that you have to buy for each different kind of vehicle you work on. Yeah, the readers are becoming a little bit more affordable. Now they're starting to integrate OBD2 and CAN readers. And I, I think even like Harbor Freight has one that's under 100 bucks that does both. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure how entailed that is and, and how deep into the menus you can go with it. But, but nonetheless, yeah, you're right. You know, the, the, the real CAN diagnostic tools are rather expensive. But... You're, the, you, what, you, what you said, the, you'll, they'll get you through every system in the entire vehicle. Boy, it would be nice, though, uh, for the manufacturers and for the, the folks out on the road, uh, especially for gas mileage, uh, with a lot less copper uh, or aluminum or whatever they're using for wires uh, to try to save weight and cost. So uh, less copper means less weight and less expense, at least for the manufacturer. So it's really cool. It's uh, I don't know if you guys picked that up and what Josh was, was saying, but there's really good reasons for this this technology. Uh, but it does make it harder to work on, especially if you have no uh, uh, experience with electronics or networking or any of those other fun things. And hey, if you guys are looking for more tech, uh, we're going to be putting it up on our forum, uh, jeeptalkshowforum.com. And uh, and all these tech talk segments that we do, I've been slowly trying to get them updated and get in there so you guys can actually have a text version of these and uh, be able to ask questions, get things answered, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that over on our forums, guys, and uh, I will be updating these as, as we go along. Yeah, I'll just throw it out there. If you guys would uh, pester uh, companies to advertise with us and maybe donate to the site and so on and so forth, we could actually hire Josh away from his job. <laughs> so his, his only job would be to, to work on the show, and then I could uh, send him messages about, have you updated the website yet, Josh? Right. No, I mean, Part I of my job. I mean, <laughs> so nice. <laughs> you say that now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you say Be that careful now. what you wish for, that whole thing. <laughs> All right, well, uh, let's get over to some voicemails. Always enjoy those. Hey, this is Tony. And I'm Tammy. And this is Josh. And you've reached our 24-7 voicemail line. You guys know what to do, so at the beep, leave your message. Yeah, I love hearing from all of you guys, so be sure and call our voicemail line, 530-675-4102, or just jump over to our website, jeeptalkshow.com, and leave us a message. All you got to do is click on the Leave Voicemail button. Hey, Tony, this is uh, Rob GoVenture. Um, I'm listening to listening to some uh, back episodes, I think it's episode 262, where you're talking about uh, uh, header leak, and you're looking for ways to band-aid it and whatnot. I'm not sure if you found a solution yet, but uh, what I did on my XJ is I found some uh, high temperature, uh, like JB Weld. It wasn't the JB Weld brand. I don't remember exactly what brand it was, but uh, I used that and I ran the, the Jeep a few times around the block, kind of let that, let that putty get up to temperature and uh, kind of smoked for a while. And then after <laughs> a few cycles, I guess it cooked on and it held. Uh, it held for at least, uh, I don't know, six more months up to the point that I sold the, the XJ. Uh, well, this is low dollar fix and, and whatnot. But uh, my buddy, Sean Caldwell, uh, really kind of told me to look at uh, either the, the motor mount and uh, the transmission mount uh, as possible causes for the, you know, the cracking. And of course, you know, the high tent and whatnot. But I, I did have newer motor mount, uh, and uh, I did have a bad uh, training mount. So uh, we swapped that out, go on that JV weld type stuff, that buddy cooked it up. And uh, like I said, for at least six months, it worked fine until I, I sold the Jeep. So uh, <laughs> I guess you may want to just uh, try that, or maybe that'll help something else out with me in the future. 
Uh, yeah, it took me a little bit. I didn't realize what it was that he was talking about. I didn't go back and look at the episode. What I was, what I was whining and bitching about back then. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I should go. I, I would. I had a little bit of a uh, of time. I would have ran out in the garage and actually grabbed the stuff that he's talking about. I, I have a little jar of that left over from when I tried to do the exact same thing that he's talking uh-huh. about. And and yeah, it's it's basically just a like a high temp JB weld type stuff, but it's not JB weld. It's a two part epoxy type stuff, putty, if you will, and. And you put it together, and it's it looks kind of metallic-y and, and coppery and, and stuff, and uh, uh, and it sets. And yeah, you're right. It, it smokes a little bit after it you know dries and cures, and uh, you put it through a couple of heat cycles. But mine held for a good three months, solid. I, I think you, I even uh, had a wheeling trip or two in in that time. Um, but eventually, it did recrack. And and yeah, he's right. You hit the nail right on the head again uh, with the motor mounts, the transmission mounts. That's the number one cause for you know cracked headers. So. Uh, you got to check that first before you start looking at a band-aids and repairs, but I'm really curious. Uh, he mentioned Sean Caldwell. Uh, I wonder if that's the famous voice talent that used to work for CNN and the weather channel. And uh, he's done a bunch of stuff for uh, uh, a bunch of network TV sh- uh, stations. So I wonder if that's the same Sean Caldwell that I'm familiar with. And I don't know the guy, but, uh, uh, yeah. Hey Sean, if you got any extra work, uh, I'll be happy to <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, he could be, <laughs> uh, just because he's uh, friends with me on Facebook doesn't mean he's not. But I think it lowers the the possibility. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me ask you a question: When you applied that uh, the uh, that epoxy mix, how difficult yeah. was it to put on there and seal it up? Well, it was rather difficult because I did it with the header still on the vehicle, and uh, as if you guys ever tried to get your hands up and into the you know where the collectors are and and stuff. I mean, there's not a lot of room to no, work up in not. there. So you know, trying to get this stuff in where I was pretty sure where the cracks were. I mean, I, I got it in there. I definitely used more than I probably needed to just for the sake of, well, I need to get this as filled as I can right. so that it's, you know, it's, it's as patched as it's going to be. Um, and, and so I think I probably got about 85, 90% of the cracks filled or, or whatever. Um, but it wasn't perfect and it wasn't easy. I think I just used rubber gloves in my fingers. Um, I might have used like a zip tie or something to get into the very, you know, the right at the bottom of the Y or something like that. But, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, there's no easy way to do it. You see, so you just kind of got to get the stuff in there any way you can. Yeah. I was wondering because if it lasts just three months, if as long as it's not hard to apply, I think it is expensive though, but if it wasn't hard to apply it, it just having to do something, you know, four times a year is not so bad. I mean, you know, do it right, pull it off, reweld it, buy a new yeah. one, something like that. Uh, I think I'm going to make some out of uh, titanium for mine and oh, just make the whole thing, you know, so it lasts did I, forever. Did I, ever, did I ever tell you what happened with uh, with welding my header, the problem that I faced with uh, with doing that? I don't, so, I don't think so. So I, I had several cracks in, in an aftermarket header, and I didn't want to junk the aftermarket header. It right. was an APN-style header, and I, you know, spent some decent money on it. I, you know, wanted to salvage it if I could. Sure. So... Uh, there's a little bit beyond my abilities to weld. I, I don't have gas shield on my welder, so it was uh, like, well, you know, I this is kind of thin metal. I don't want to just completely blow it out. Took it to a buddy uh, who was you know, a little bit more set up for for that kind of welding, and he hooked me up. And so, in afternoon, we kind of you know tacked it together, burned it in, and it was good to go. The problem was is that the just the heating up of the metal and and the sealing of those of those cracks and whatnot the process of welding it was enough to heat the metal enough to where it slightly wrote or not not rotated but slightly tilted the downpipe the the you know the output right so my where my downpipe coll- uh, connects that that coupler right there it doesn't line up just right so I'm I'm now stuck at this point where well now I have to either get a flex joint have a different downpipe made again which because this is a custom downpipe that I had made to reduce the the factory restrictor that's in there right um and uh, or or you know I completely redo my exhaust from scratch and and just start over I would uh, um, number three I'll go with the third uh, option <laughs> well that's <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of on the radar a little bit because well now is the good time. It, well, well, sure. You know, if you got that checkbook, if, if you got money, <laughs> of course. I mean, there's a, right, there are yeah. these little things, the little uh, details you have to have. <laughs> right. You know, since I'm doing all the stuff, you know, with the head work and, and everything else, uh, you know, and and all the other modifications that I've done with the board out throttle body and the jet, you know, the stage two chip and and all this other stuff that I've done, it makes sense for me now to go from a two and a quarter 
to a two and a half inch exhaust. I kept two and a quarter because I wanted to keep my torque lower in the RPM range. Right. And I think with everything that I've done, I can kind of sort of offset that restriction, let things breathe a little bit easier, and I'm not going to be moving the horsepower too far in the RPM or in the, in the I'm not going to be moving well, the torque in too far in the RPM range. And to remind everybody, you have a board throttle body. I think you have a less restrictive uh, intake. Uh, I forget yep. what you did. Was it a can in or was it actually uh, through the... Uh, um, did you run it up to the cowl? Is that I did? Yeah. So I've got a cowl induction right. uh, set up. It's a, a 63 millimeter board throttle body, 65 millimeter board throttle body spacer. Um, it's, uh, so that's what he's I, talking about. He's getting more air into the engine. The, uh, the computer is, is throwing more fuel in there for that mix. And now uh, he's thinking that he can get a larger uh, exhaust port going basically to get that, that more air and fuel out. So, because if it's restrictive, it will uh, limit your horsepower. Uh, yeah, so. absolutely. So I've got, you know, I've got a high flow cat, high flow exhaust, uh, high flow muffler. You know, all that stuff's all been you'd upgraded. Have, you'd have to change that to two and a half, right? You'd have to change all that stuff to two and a half. It would all have to get changed to two and a half. Yeah. yeah. So that's so. another reason why I'm like, mm, it's already high flow. It's already all aftermarket. So. Well, you know uh, what the solution is here, right? Yeah, V8. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, if you, you're going to have all these perfectly good parts, it's time to buy another Cherokee, and yeah, then you right. put them, then you put them on that one, <laughs> and pretty soon you're living under a bridge with your two Cherokees. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's got a tent strapped up in between them. I'm good to go. Toolbox and a tent. A jammock. You'll have a jammock between the two. <laughs> All right, well, let's get over. We are doing voicemails, believe yeah, it or not, Yeah, we are folks. doing, I know, that's right. <laughs> You'd think <laughs> that we were in a different segment here. See, Tammy would be here ringing a bell going, let's move on. Let's move it on, people. <laughs> let's get over to Nate. Hey, guys, it's Nate. Uh, after the audio problems we seem to have when I called in on my phone, I thought I'd try SpeakPipe from my awesome microphone here that I use to record my segments. So this should be much improved. <laughs> so uh, there were two voicemails that I left you after episode 279. One was simply stating that uh, I was enjoying Josh's segments on his trail fixes. Uh, Josh, you ever held a ball joint together with a ratchet strap? I've been there. <laughs> uh, so good good information, and I'm really enjoying it. And uh, I guess I've heard all of it at this point after hearing episode 280, right? I don't know. Is there more to come? That'd be awesome. I really enjoyed it. Uh, the other thing was Tammy was hemming and hawing about how to modify her Jeep uh, going forward because of her new interest in overlanding. And I just wanted to share with her that she has come to the crossroads that all Jeepers come to. That yeah. is the point where you have to own more than one Jeep. <laughs> Tammy, you may as well just throw in the towel. Go buy yourself a nice little two-door TJ uh, and uh, use that on the trails. Um, and use your nice big four-door for your overland adventures. And while you're at it, go get yourself a big pickup truck and a uh, trailer oh, because yeah. you're going to have Toe. to do it eventually anyway. Thanks. You know, uh, he Love says this guy. He, he says <laughs> ratchet strap and uh, ball joint. It uh, brought me a flashback on that long weekend in Vegas. <laughs> Takes me back to the day I sheared my track bar mount off my frame. Oh, good times. Good times. Yeah. There's no really repairing that is. I mean, uh, oh, no, got, there, there is. Unless with you enough, got bailing with wire. enough ratchet straps, you can repair anything. <laughs> oh, gee, that would be that would be a scary drive. I'm hoping that it, wasn't, it was. I'm it hoping was. that wasn't, I, I was, wasn't home. That was just down the trail to get on something to be dr driven home. No, I, it was solid enough to where I not only drove it off the trail, but I did drive it home. I was limited oh, to about geez. 45 miles per hour before uh, the mother of all uh, death wobbles wobble. uh, came into play. <laughs> and, uh, and that was also coincidentally the day that I was pulled over for a fender flare violation. <laughs> Uh, and was you think that's by bad? Look at this. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I told him because he pulled me over. He's like, why'd you have your flashers on? You can't be driving down the street with your flashers on. I'm like. Uh, well, if you come over here and see this massive pile of ratchet straps, you can see that I'm barely even limping home, sir. Um, yada, yada. He decided to uh, hear <laughs> none of it and slap me with a fat oh, old ticket. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. No, it's the Oregon State Patrol. I don't really have a whole lot of love for. So, um, yeah. <sighs> Gee, I just knew he was going to feel your pain and go, son, you go right ahead. Get this piece of crap off my freeway as quickly as you can. Well, he originally tried to pull me over for speeding, and I was like, <laughs> you were heading the opposite direction, and not only that, but uh, no, I can't speed. This vehicle cannot do a mile over 45 miles per hour, and here's why. 
Oh no. my God! Was it, was it that, so, that's when he switched his. That's when he switched his story to the fender flares because yeah. he couldn't get me on anything else. And so here yeah. you go. Yeah, that makes sense. It didn't matter. It was this. You you fit the description, yeah. as they say. <laughs> yeah, I think he had something against Jeeps. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's. Uh, no, I, I was going to go for the Toyota joke, but ever, too many people do that. I like Toyotas. It's fine. I'm. You know, I'm not going to pick on anybody. So uh, we started a, a a bit of an overlanding segment um, probably a month or so ago uh, with. Uh, I'd like to say, Tony, that we started the overlanding craze. <laughs> well, we may have uh, may have am made, taking, I, may have made too many more than a few. Here? Yeah, may have made more than a few people go get out of the house. And I got to get away from this. So uh, that might have started the overlanding. But uh, I guess a couple of months ago, I, I started with uh, you know what is overlanding. And uh, I wanted to do an overlanding segment and get some information from some folks that know more about it than I do, which I basically don't know anything. And uh, Dan over the 4x4 podcast was uh, kind enough to do a, uh, to record a, a series that we're going to start tonight. And we're going to start with that same uh, start that I did a couple of months ago. Uh, what is overlanding? And, and keep in mind, this is from somebody that has done it. He's lived it. He's lived the life, at least a month of it anyway. Hey, Dan Cole from the 4x4 Podcast, a member of the 4x4 Radio Network, is joining us to help with the Jeep Talk Show's Overland series. So, Dan, uh, I've recently tried to answer the question, but since you have actual overlanding experience by virtue of bringing your family overland from the central U.S. to Alaska, I think you might have a better definition of what overlanding is. So, what is overlanding? Well, uh, first off, thanks for having me on. Um, but I think you guys did a pretty good job of defining what it is in the lack of a definition entirely. <laughs> um, it, it certainly can be, there's such a wide range that really I, I kind of call it a overland style of travel. Um, but whenever somebody asks, well, where should I go overlanding or I was going to go overlanding this weekend, that, that totally misses the, the concept. Really, overlanding in itself is basically, I think... I think Josh said it. it's, you know, vehicle dependent uh, travel where the journey is the point and not the destination. Um, so there's people that are traveling around the world on bicycles and they are overlanding um, because they're traveling in that overland style. Uh, so that's really kind of the, the biggest thing that defines it. Um, but if you're just going out for the weekend to go camping and off-roading at the same time, really you're just going camping and off-roading in an overland style. Uh, type of travel. Does that make any sense? So let me make sure if I understand this right. Overlanding would be um, something that would be a long trip that you're dependent upon your vehicle to not only get you from point A to point B, but you're actually living uh, kind of like out of that vehicle. Not, uh, not maybe camping. not necessarily because some people still use ground tents um, in in their overland style transportation. It's not like they're living inside, right? Um, you know, and I used a trailer with a tent on top. It's not an RV. It's not a Unimog with a camper on the back. Uh, it's really, really just more about the, the journey than the destination. Okay. So it doesn't have anything to do with a vehicle or uh, where you're going. It just has to do about uh, the adventure uh, and getting out. It doesn't have to be the vehicle. Uh, it could be a bicycle. It could be anything. Absolutely. It could be backpacking. So I can foot. go in a. I go like fishing and hunting, but I travel in the overland style where I, I kind of base camp out of the, the vehicle. Um, and I, I, I try not to stay in the same place for too much time because there's so much, you know, awesome scenery to be explored that really that's just what I'm trying to do. Okay. So uh, now I know you have uh, uh, a roundtable discussion and you do overlanding. Uh, you, you discuss overlanding with, with people that have actually done overlanding is it is it difficult to define for everybody, or do people some people have uh, set definitions of what overlanding is and isn't? Well, I, I think there are some purists who like like if you're not gone for more than a year, then you have not been overlanded. <laughs> um, but I, I certainly don't fall into that category, and I don't think any of my uh, fellow overland roundtablers also fall into that category. Uh, Okay. We're, we're pretty open to a lot of different definitions. Gotcha. So it's kind of like the overland style, I guess, is what we're getting at here. Is that it's, uh, but it's not camping. See that because that's that's the thing that confused me is like if you go in camping, <laughs> then that would be overlanding because you're getting there and back. So 
I'm still not clear on the overlanding thing. Yeah, well, and it's funny because some people say the the definition or the name overlanding kind of had its genesis in Australia. Well, one of my you know fellow roundtablers is in Australia, and and they don't go overlanding; they go uh, touring. You know, they go <laughs> explore the the tracks. So I, I don't know where the definition technically came from, but it certainly had a a newfound success, and it is the uh, I don't know the big the big buzzword or the catchphrase that everybody wants to go overlanding. Interesting. Well, I'm still not clear on it. I think everybody else isn't. I think this you actually have to go out and do it and live it, uh, and then you would know uh, what, what it is. Or perhaps it's just important uh, it be what you find uh, that fits your needs. Right, right. And, I, and I'm certainly not going to be the person that tells anybody that they're wrong. They didn't go overlanding. I, I will laugh to myself <laughs> if you say I went overlanding this weekend. Um, but that's, you won't hear that. I'll, I'll keep that to myself. Well, it was a great, uh, first, uh, segment with Dan and we have several more to come. So, uh, keep listening to uh, future episodes of the Jeep talk show for more of those overlanding updates with Dan at the four by four podcast. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Good stuff. Good information. Hey, uh, you guys already know we talked about earlier in the show a way that you guys can interact with us and, well, in the show live. And uh, Nikki G normally calls into the show. It was his birthday last week. We called him, actually, and wished him a happy birthday. Caught him a little off guard. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, but he tweeted the show, actually, live here and says, Garlic makes my feet stink. <laughs> All right. I can just see Nikki G uh, in his Jeep, <clears throat> aluminum foil on his head with his foot up in his face. <laughs> Yep. yep, it smells garlic. bad. <laughs> oh, garlic and that spaghetti last night. <laughs> you know, it just dawned on me. Uh, we didn't have a Nikki G for this week, but do you know we have one for last week that we didn't play? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, because he well, called okay. one in. He didn't know we were calling. It was a completely That's surprise. True. That's right. That's right. So uh, if you don't mind, let's uh, let's play the, yeah. the Nikki G from last week. Let's go. Hey, this is Nikki G. And I got a call over the phone line because my <laughs> iPhone still will not open the speed pipe app, even though I deleted it and re-downloaded it. It's like Steve Jobs is mocking at me from the on the grave. <laughs> He's haunting me. Anyhow, uh, just got back from the uh, New Orleans Asian hosted by the Carolina Trails off-road yesterday, today, Sunday now. Because I couldn't call because I couldn't get my speed pipe open. <laughs> but uh, just wanted to give a shout out to those guys. They're very, very friendly, very nice. So uh, they really uh, emphasized Southern uh, hospitality. They treated me as like one of their own right off the bat. You know, so if anybody's out out that out this way, North Carolina, South Carolina, Carolina way, uh, look them up. Carolina Trails Off Road. They got a Facebook page. Uh, pretty nice guys. And uh, I'm that Brian from uh, Route 16, and that's Route R O O T, not R O U T, with my uh, redneck accent. <laughs> I had a hard time finding him online, but I met him up there. Very nice guy. I think he was on the show one time before because the name really sounds familiar. He was a really nice guy, and I'd say anybody need any deep parts, contact him. But uh, that's not the reason why I'm calling uh, today. I'm calling. Because I owe Josh an apology for if airplanes are not flying over, it's traffic wasn't by. Come on, man, give me a break. <laughs> but uh, I owe Josh an apology from uh, last week. Call that from uh, Sir Crassel. I wanted to know a question to stump Josh, and it was bull crap off the start. <laughs> and I apologize. <laughs> but I do have a good, really uh, serious question for stump Josh. Uh oh. Here we go. Besides the taste, what is the difference between an oral and a rectal thermometer? <laughs> yeah, it's a conundrum. All right, boys and girls, I'll uh, catch you later. Have a good one. Bye. Yeah, and I really something all right. This, uh, not being held down by the 90-second thing for speak pipe. Yeah. But uh, it's forcing me to do it all in one take, which is kind of good because now I've been showing up for rehearsals. <laughs> <laughs> All right, boys and girls, again, I'll chat you later. 
Yeah, good one. So the, so the oral and rectal thermometer is the most important thing to remember when you have those two is proper this labeling. One, <laughs> this one goes in your mouth. This one goes in. No, wait, no. This one goes in your mouth. This one goes in your mouth. Uh, it's it's kind of like burning a candle at both ends. <laughs> no, it's nothing like that. There should no, be no fire involved in either one of those so, ends. If it's burning, you might need to go to the doctor. <laughs> All right, well, that's enough of that. Amazon.com and the Jeep Talk Show present <laughs> You Bought What? what? Um, oh, glad I remembered about that. <laughs> what have you guys been buying? Well, uh, if you want to support the show, we've got a couple ways that you can do it. The best way, of course, is to think of the Jeep Talk Show anytime you do online shopping. Just use jeeptalkshow.com slash Amazon first, and it takes you, takes you straight to amazon.com where you can do all of your online shopping as you ordinarily would. But anything that you purchase, well, Amazon's agreed to give us a small kickback. That's right. You don't pay a dime more, not a red cent more. But, well, it's a great way to stick it to the man. We get a little cut of the, of the action, and, uh, well, you guys help out your favorite off-road podcast. Oh, it's a sweet deal. It doesn't cost you anything different. And all you have to do is just, uh, well, it costs a little bit of time. You just got to go over to jeeptalkshow.com slash Amazon first, and then it'll take you straight to Amazon, then find it and buy it. Uh, again, yeah. 747s, that's the way to go. If you got the cash, buy it on Amazon, and don't forget to uh, you know, bring us into the, the, whole, the whole deal. There'll be a house in it for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> what do we got first up, Tony? It is the Loctite Heavy Duty Thread Locker, a 0.2 ounce. What the hell is this stuff? I don't think gold costs this much. But anyway, uh, it's blue, 242, single tube, $4.72. Okay, let me, let me repeat this. It's 0.2 ounces for $4.72. Good God. It's not like not even a thimble full. Oh, gee, it's like a, a, a Nat's fart, a juicy fart. Uh, thread locker blue, 242 uh, locker threaded metal fasteners uh, protects against uh, loosening, uh, prevents leaks and rusting of threads for quarter inch to three quarter inch nuts and bolts, sets in 20 minutes, cures in 24 hours. Useful for uh, small motors, mowers, and power equipment. Once cured, parts are removable with hand tools for disassembly. Uh, not to be used as a personal lubricant. No, no, now, no. Now, no. if you're doing something where it's going to set in 24 hours, man, you're doing it right. <laughs> 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 if you got to be well, concerned about it setting in 24 hours, you're doing it right. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? Well, you might be able to use some of this to uh, clean up in the middle of it all. Uh, this is the thumbs up glow in the dark toilet paper oh, for yeah. $10.96 a roll. Well, at least they give you free shipping. Just when you thought everything that could have been invented has been, yeah, now we have this. Now you'll always be able to find the toilet paper, even in the dark, with this new glow-in-the-dark toilet paper. If you don't want to wake up anyone in your household at night by turning on the light, you can follow the glow of this groovy loo roll to your bathroom. <laughs> Perfect for power outages or glow-in-the-dark mummy outfits. Hey, how about that? This exciting bathroom accessory will ensure you'll never want to use normal paper again. It's a perfect novelty gift. It's, you can always find the toilet paper, even in the dark. Uh, and, uh, well, they're not going to be responsible for irritated, uh, irritated or permanently glowing sphincters. Irritated. Um, although, a, a, a irritated, uh, a sphincter might be, uh, fun during Halloween. So, uh, this is funny. You, you have this toilet paper, uh, up, uh, up here, but uh, recently you probably saw the commercial where you can have the motion activated toilet light. Oh yeah, I think that was on Shark Tank in some fashion. Or I another. bought one for the house. It is great. You walk in, and you don't have to, disco pee. <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to turn the light on. It's it senses your thing and it lights up the toilet bowl. This is a perfect companion to that. <laughs> the, the glow in the dark toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, put a lava lamp on the back of the bowl. You'll be good to go, man. <laughs> and you know what? I bought it from Amazon. Just check the chin strap for your ass, bro. You bought. <laughs> Oh my god! I just can't believe that made it on the list. <laughs> I did. I really did. It was like fifteen bucks. It's great. Fifteen dollars. It's like nothing. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think we can rush through a uh, campfire side chat here, can't we, Josh? Yeah, I got one little thing. I hate skipping it all the time. I just I like doing the campfire side chat. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's it's neat. It's uh, unfortunately, I wish I had something more pleasant to talk about. But uh, buddy hit me up this morning. He's just like, hey. Keep the word out. Jeep was stolen last night. So it's a 96 green Cherokee uh, sitting on uh, 30s. And 
it's got a, a PDX and a, uh, a Dutch Brothers sticker on the back. So, uh, oh, and both uh, front turn signal lights are broken. Did you get the uh, Did you get the the phone number for the guy that stole your Honda twice? Maybe you could just text him and ask him what he knows. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, if you do have any information on this, uh, please hit up the Gresham Police Department. Uh, once again, it's a '96 green Jeep Cherokee. Um. Mm, yeah, I guess green Jeeps are okay. So uh, I just want to announce really quick: it's looking kind of good for me going to a Hidden Falls Off Road Park Memorial Day weekend. That is in oh, Marlboro I'm Falls, jealous. Texas. Never been there. Several people uh, that I know here locally have been and say that is the place to go wheeling instead of the places that are kind of close to where we are. Uh, it's about an hour drive for the close oh, places. That's not bad. No, no, wait, wait for it. It's about an hour drive for the close places. This one is a three-hour drive. Uh, that's a that's a. It's like what Tammy does every you know every other yeah. weekend driving to Roush Week. It's, it's a bit of a drive. I mean that for for me that'd be like for for me driving from Portland to Seattle. Yeah, and it's about three hours. You know, it's a, it's a good trek. You know, but. Uh, uh, you know, definitely going to make a full day out of it. You want to leave oh, nice yeah. and early. Yeah, yeah, that's the plan. Also, too, it'd be nice to drive when it's uh, dark out, so I don't have to uh, monitor that temperature gauge uh, real carefully. <laughs> How Al- nervous although, are you? <laughs> al- no, although it's been doing very well. We had a like a, a, a it was close to ninety or a ninety degree day today, and I think it was two o four on the freeway. Heated up when I got off the freeway, but that's to be expected because the airflow is not as as high. So sure. I think I think I'll be okay. Uh, and if nothing else, I can always pull over and let it cool down and, and then uh, continue on. So it, it cools off yeah. pretty fast. So uh, anyway, looking forward to doing uh, doing that and uh, not looking forward to the drive, not looking forward to being tired, but it's going to be damn fun being out there. And it's going to be wonderful getting back home without having broken anything. Because yeah, I, I really. need the experience of, of the confidence of I can take it off road and bring it back home and it's going to be there in one piece. It, I, I, I don't fine. care about driving on the freeway or any place like that. I don't worry about breaking it, but that's because I have all this experience. You get a little more experience off road and I mean, I'll be fine, but it's still, it's a little nerve wracking yeah, when it's a daily keep yourself driver. Out of, keep yourself out of harm's way, you know, just, you know, you know, keep, uh, keep yourself out of the, you know, too hard of stuff and, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, I, I, have, have fun. I, I was telling a friend that I'm a little nervous about it, but then again, I don't have to climb that five foot vertical wall. I can always go around. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Take the bypass. Yep. So looking forward to that. Anybody that uh, would like to go, this it's an open thing. Uh, Just, uh, you know, give us a shout over info at jeeptalkshow.com. And, uh, you know, maybe we can get together. Maybe we can ride out there uh, uh, front and back, rear, whatever. And uh, happy to uh, 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 trail somebody out there. And it'd be fun to have you have you go out there with me. Yeah, that'd be really cool. I wish I could go, Tony, but it'd be about an 18-hour drive for me, and yeah, I'm just not going to do it. Well, see, it's that suck-ass attitude that keeps you from <laughs> <know>. doing it. <laughs> oh, and the, and the 40 hours of work that you have to put into the Jeep <laughs> before yeah, you exactly. get there. exactly. Right. But it would be a great break-in trip. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> you get 12 hours from home and something, some little something that wasn't tight and would have crap yeah. out. <laughs> All right, well, let's get over to some wheeling wear. I hope we got some good wheeling wear tonight, Josh. Yeah, we got a whole bunch of stuff. Actually, this is where we're going to talk about what events are coming up in your neck of the woods and around the nation. Uh, a little bit this uh, this kind of came in a little bit late, but we're going to get this out to you guys uh, anyways. Uh, Extreme Terrain presents Jeeps at the Farm Saturday, May twentieth. So as we record this, it is happening this weekend. So we're going to try and get the show out Friday. That means you guys have a day to prepare and and get out there. May twentieth, nine a.m. to five p.m. Rain or shine, this is happening. Shady Brook Farm. 931 Stony Hill Road in Yardley, Pennsylvania. This is all things Jeep event with hundreds of Jeeps, you know, all makes and years. An obstacle course with a mud bog, live music, parts vendors, and if that ain't enough to get you out there, they're going to have one hell of a beer, wine, and food garden too. So, yeah, you guys definitely want to check this out. Uh, happening the week after, May 27th, Big Trail Blaze in Chaos Off-Road Park, Captain Bridge, West Virginia. Uh, for more information, head over to chaosoffroadpark.com. This is a charity trail riding event hosted by East Coast 4x4. There will be games and raffles, and all proceeds will benefit Chaos Hero Project. 
And you guys may have been hearing some rumors lately. Jeeps Beach West is, uh, well, it's being postponed. It was supposed to happen here in June, and it's looking like it's probably not going to happen until September, October, well, maybe even November. Uh, but anyways, uh, keep uh, keep your eyes on Jeeps Beach, jeepbeachwest.com for more information. They're trying to get the state park to, uh, to get a date locked down for this event. It's going to be huge. Uh, hopefully it'll huge. happen while the weather's still good. <laughs> huge. <laughs> huge. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have the Cadillac Jeepers presenting the 16th annual Jeep Blessing. We've reported on this just about every year, guys. May 6th, 2017, Ellen's Corner Pizza in Messick, Michigan. Uh, mm. We feel it's important to ask for a blessing from God on the off-road season this year I and mean, every year. Um, this is why we have the blessing early in the year. We also enjoy the camaraderie of fellow enthusiasts and the ability to see the latest off-road hardware and, of course, what Jeep has up the pipeline. The Cadillac Jeepers also feel it is very necessary to give back to the communities in which they live. Not only are we asking for a blessing for safety, but want a blessing to those in our communities. That's from Pastor Chad. Uh, so if you guys want to le- learn more about this event and, and what it can do for you, well, CadillacJeepers.com slash Jeep Blessing. Check it out. So I feel kind of bad. I was talking about the Marble Falls, Hidden Falls uh, thing that's happening Memorial Day weekend. And that would have been perfect for, for Wheeling Wear. And I was trying to find it on the invite that I got on Facebook, and I can't find it. So what I'll do is I'll put that in the show notes. So if you want to get more information on uh, the Hidden Falls, uh, it, it's in Texas, if, if you don't already know. Uh, if, if you want to get more information for that, you don't have to be in Texas. You can drive down. You can drive the 18 hours that Josh was talking about coming from, uh, from Oregon. That's fine. You can do that if you want to. I mean, it is more, more Memorial Day weekend, so most people have at least I one of those days of off. Time. Yeah, plenty of time. Uh, but <laughs> but they're going to be out there all weekend. I'm just planning on going up Saturday morning, early Saturday morning, and then driving back sun, uh, Saturday evening. I'm not going to camp out. Uh, fat boy in uh, Texas heat is not a good Ooh. thing. I'll be making my own gravy. And it's not the good kind. So uh, anyway, <laughs> but I'll, I'm planning on being there Saturday. Uh, I still have a couple of things I got to do on the Jeep first. It means this weekend, got to get it done. If I'm going to go the following weekend, which I believe that's what it is, the the, the 29th or something, I, I believe. So uh, I, anyway, I'll get that up on show notes so you get more information on it if you'd like to dig it out there. I think it's like 25 bucks for the day uh, for uh, one vehicle, one rider. Not too shabby. Yeah. It's it's more than what I'd like to pay, but then again, then again, I'm cheap. I hear that. <laughs> so, are you new to the show? Maybe you're watching us on uh, YouTube. Uh, it is your very first time with us? Well, we want you to know we uh, we make it easy to listen to the show while you're on the go. You can install the Jeep Talk Show app on your Apple or Android device. Of course, you can always find our episodes at JeepTalkShow.com, the website. That's right. And we've told you that it can take days for our podcast to appear on various podcasting sources like iTunes or Stitcher Radio. You can change all that by downloading and installing the Jeep Talk Show app on your Apple phone or tablet or on your Android phone or tablet. With our new apps, you can truly have the latest Jeep Talk Show episode on demand. Continuing our domination of all things media, we are on YouTube. That's right, guys. It's how we bring the show to you live twice a week. Watch the live show or watch past shows even at youtube.com slash Jeep Talk Show. And oh, if you subscribe, you'll be notified of new videos as they get released. Hey, are you thinking, uh, boy, the Jeep Talk Show sounds like a fun? Sounds like fun. Are you fun? I guess either one's fine. I wonder if I could be part of the show. Of course you can't. Just send an email to info at jeeptalkshow.com and tell us your idea of what you can do for the show. We love our listeners, and we'd love to get you guys involved in the show. Hey, are you listening? Yeah, to what, you may ask? <laughs> well, the Deep Talk Show, a call-in show, of course. What is this, you may ask? Well, boy, you ask a lot of questions. <laughs> well, it's a podcast that you can call into. Our team of JTS scientists have devised a way that you and Tony, well, that Tony and Tammy can stream the audio and video live to you, and you can talk back. I know, it's a little scary actually getting the chance to tell Tony what you think of his jokes, but really, <laughs> it's fun. Trust, trust me, I do it all the time. Join Tony and Tammy every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Central Time, and call in youtube.com slash jeep talk show well that's it for this week guys until next week be sure to follow us on twitter instagram and tumblr friend us on facebook circle us like vultures on google plus and be sure to tell a friend about the jeep talk show and no matter where you're wheeling if you pack it in make sure you pack it out let's leave our outdoor recreation spots in as good if not better the condition than they were when we arrived remember to always tread lightly Stay on designated trails and don't wheel where you're not supposed to. If you'd like to learn more about the uh, Tread Lightly principles and how you can help keep our trails and public lands open for off-road use, head over to treadlightly.org.
Hey, you're making a purchase at Amazon. Be sure and go to jeeptalkshow.com slash Amazon first. Hey, don't forget about our survey. Please take a moment to take our survey at jeeptalkshow.com slash survey. Uh, catch the pre and post show shenanigans by watching the full unedited recording of the live show on youtube.com slash jeeptalkshow. Oh, the shenanigans. <laughs> Yeah, there's some, sometimes there's a lot, sometimes there's not as much. <laughs> hey, hey, Josh, you guys need, there you go, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, if you guys need a voice for your product or your business, uh, or you got something else you're working on that might need a voice, well, by all means, just hit me up at thevoiceofjosh.com. Let's quickly go to Tammy. Tammy? Yeah, I think she fell asleep. All right, so... <laughs> You guys have a great, you see it on the video. She's just sitting there with, you know, like she's got her eyes closed. All right. So you guys have a great uh, Jeep week and we'll see you Tuesday. Don't forget, we'll be uh, uh, interviewing Gene with uh, all things Jeep on uh, the Jeep Talk call-in show.